Okay, so uh, let's uh, consider one of the uh, probably most popular parameterizations of subgrid scale fluxes, turbulent fluxes, um, uh, so called 1.5 closure, uh, 1.5 order closure. Um, why it's popular? Well, because it's simple. Sorry about that. Um, simple uh, yet it's pretty comprehensive so what we mean by 1.5 closure so 1.5 order closure it is closure which is based on uh, only one second moment particular one which is uh, um, give, gives rises uh, give rises to uh, turbulent kinetic energy so it's based on turbulent or subgrid scale turbulent kinetic energy. So basically, which is defined as let's denote it with E. Oh, let me change the marker equals to U I prime uh, square mean divided by two so which is some uh, you, summation here is implied because it's squared here so it can be written like that so it's a sum of uh, variances divided by two which is kinetic energy so uh, we basically assume that all our turbulent uh, subgrid scale turbulence can be described only as a function of E's of this turbulent kinetic energy. So it's TKE. Subgrid scale TKE. So that all our all, uh, UI, UJ Reynolds stresses can be viewed as a function only of E. So how to establish this function? That's another issue that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So first let's write the prognostic equation, equation for TKE. Um, so basically how it's done, I already kind of indicated, uh, you have a prognostic equation for I's component of momentum, um, T, D, X, J, U, I, U, J, prime, um, just like that equals to blah 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 and then uh, you average it so you have your prognostic e equation for grid scale you basically know those right uh, grid scale uh, momentum components so they would be like grid scale advection and here are some terms and here you have, uh, uh, well, first of all, in here you have term that I didn't consider before. It's buoyancy term, because turbulence is driven by buoyancy. And we use Businesco approximations that we considered in previous lecture when we discussed filtered equation. So it's some buoyancy uh, times delta I3, where delta is a so-called Kronecker uh, index, which is like our symbol. This is delta Ij equals to one when i equals to j and zero when i not equal to j so delta i3 means that for i component when i equal to three this buoyancy term is operating which is third component third component of momentum is in the vertical so makes sense so just its notation and plus uh, some molecular diffusion which we write without strain tensor because we already simplified it due d second derivative u i d x uh, d x uh, j square so you average this equation so you get your averaged equation and average buoyancy is of course zero right because buoyancy is defined as minus g rho prime or rho naught and rho prime of course uh, average of perturbation is zero you can define it like using an elastic approximation 
like your buoyancy well, buoyancy here buoyancy equals to then it's change of sign it's perturbation of potential temperature something like that so it could be two forms whatever you prefer depends on your prognostic equation for uh, temperature or you have prognostic equation for density so um, and, and then you subtract one from the other so you have prognostic equation for I perturbation not averaged and then you multiply it by ui by perturbation and then you average it so it would produce then ddt ui prime squared averaged over 2 which is de dt and some other terms so i'm not going to derive it of course uh, it's a little bit uh, too tedious, but I will write uh, the final result. So the final result, so-called prognostic equation for TT, would be looking like that. DDT E, so I'll plus, or if you write it in flux form, d, d, d x j uh, u j mean times e. So this is just advection of uh, kinetic energy. Uh, so it, it, it equals to uh, minus uh, <coughs> d dx j uh, this pressure times uh, uh, u j prime averaged minus uh, d dx j e u j prime So this is triple moment that I was talking about, right? Because E is an uh, um, expression like this. So times Ej and then you uh, average it. Then it's, it, it's like triple moment. <coughs> and uh, then uh, minus, <coughs> uh, minus uh, D U uh, I average d x j u i u j prime prime Reynolds stresses times this uh, gradient of mean velocity uh, plus uh, diffusion molecular diffusion of e which we uh, tend to ignore of course because well, this term is small, but we cannot ignore it when we actually talk about uh, um, dissipation. And the reason for that is that if you uh, consider this uh, molecular diffusion term of velocity component u prime, so you have second derivative du i prime dx uh, j squared. And then you multiply it, whether you multiply it by u i prime, then, uh, then if you actually do this math and use continuity equation, so you have d dx j, and you put this u i inside of this guy, d u i prime dx j. So you cannot just put it inside, you need to actually subtract something, right? So you subtract this guy for d dx j u i prime uh, and times this guy so new d u i prime dx j. So uh, 
So it it equals. So this guy is just uh, you you put it inside of this. So it's a tiny uh, uh, kinetic energy if you average it. So you you need then average it all. So you have new d e d x j squared. So just diffusion molecular diffusion of uh, turbulent kinetic energy, which can be ignored because it's much smaller than transport by resolved field uh, or, or even these guys. So this guy, because molecular diffusion is so slow, so you can ignore it, but you cannot ignore this guy. Why? Because it's a minus nu dui prime dxj squared averaged. And you see this quantity is squared, so average of it would never cancel out or become kind of small because those guys are actually big on very small scale. So this thing is the one that uh, is possible to destruction of kinetic energy by molecular forces or dissipation. So this is equal to epsilon dissipation. Dissipation of kinetic energy. Uh, without that, kinetic energy would be hard to destroy. So you know that when you have fluid moving around, it's constantly being, uh, kinetic energy of that motion is constantly being destroyed. But not, not that actually momentum cannot be destroyed by, by molecular forces. Even though your fluid is moving and then it stops, technically momentum is conserved for, for this closed system, for example. But not kinetic energy, kinetic energy is destroyed. So it's kind of weird. Where well this momentum uh, gets from a glass of water? if it stopped rotating. Well, something to think about. Okay, so uh, um, so you have this dissipation. So if you do that, uh, so you, you add this guy. So we ignore molecular diffusion. Uh, we ignore molecular diffusion. So this is minus dissipation. And, well, before we actually write that, let's add some buoyancy production. So plus U uh, I prime, this buoyancy beta uh, times, um, or we, well, we can write it explicitly, like say in terms of, um, so it's G uh, rho prime divided by rho naught times delta I three and minus dissipation. And also I forgot here, of course, the term that I erased, it's uh, minus D U uh, I average D X J U I U J primes Something like that. Okay, so let's let's now look at this equation. What it means. So this is a rate of change of kinetic energy in the grid box. This is you see local derivative in time. So in this particular grid box equals to advection of kinetic energy, convergence of fluxes through the grid box boundaries. So it can leave this box or can arrive from a, a neighboring grid boxes. So this term is responsible for that. Now this guy is a pressure correlation. So it's basically, if you, uh, uh, you can think about this as like say you have, let's say surface and you have this uh, turbine eddy striking the surface. And it, it's this, there is this, uh, 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 of course, some pressure is rising near the surface because of that fluid is going down towards the surface. And then it's uh, it's pushing its apart, so it can generate additional kinetic energy or destroy it. So this term, it's a pressure pressure generation. This one is a, a, a K, basically advection of uh, advection of kinetic energy by by turbulence itself. So itself kind of turbulence can can advect itself because turbulence is actually, so turbulent kinetic energy can advert, uh, uh, be activated by the turbulence itself. So this is basically the term. Of course, it's much smaller than this one, 
but it's actually in sort of uh, close to this guy so usually it's not actually ignored and that's actually the term what we uh, also would like to parameterize and now uh, this one is a buoyancy production so turbulence can be generated by some areas of the flow that are warmer let's say than the surroundings so you have buoyancy so you start kind of uh, rising motion and then it creates turbulence so this one averaged and this guy is dissipation i mentioned that so it's turbulence can be destroyed by uh, dissipation of kinetic energy and uh, this guy is interesting guy this one is the shear production so this is production term so this is production by shear this is production or destruction by buoyancy depending on the sign of your buoyancy production of uh, by buoyancy and this is very important in so-called uh, you know in in any boundary layer in a convective boundary layer this term is usually that is positive you have positive buoyancy net uh, kind of uh, correlation between say vertical velocity and buoyancy so you you tend to generate turbulence in stable boundary layers this term is actually because it's stable stratification this term is actually negative and it tends to destroy kinetic energy but this term is basically always positive uh, because uh, if you positive if you have so-called down uh, uh, down gradient uh, uh, counter gradient transport so if you have uh, uh, like normal molecular diffusion would do that but actually this term can be uh, sometimes uh, can uh, can flip the sign so this term generally generates kinetic energy because the UDF when the UD, like let's say that uh, there is vertical shear or horizontal component so the U dx would be positive it would increase and so it would bring so your velocity u z generally like if this is uh, u so it's increasing this height and this shear uh, so du this term would be positive because shear is positive you see it's increasing this height but of course uh, diffusion tries to bring high momentum to areas of small momentum so this is what turbulence also would do uh, but not always uh, if it's uh, so-called large areas we, we're going to talk about that uh, but generally like this small scale turbulence always uh, works like molecular diffusion so this guy would put in ne negatives then it would flip the sign so you see this term tends to increase turbulent kinetic energy so now so this is the equation that we can actually uh, add to our set of prognostic equations now um, uh, how we now so what we're looking for is these fluxes as some functional form as function of E of kinetic energy because we assume that everything is determined by level of, of turbulence in, uh, which is characterized by turbulent kinetic energy uh, which is not necessarily entirely correct assumption right you you could feel it it's why it's only all this behavior for this of this complex system could be function of just one uh, scalar quantity which is uh, turbine kinetic energy but in in one case it's actually true and that's what we're going to talk about next but generally so we look at this and also we're looking for so for we need to flow this fluxes too so we need to close buoyancy fluxes and we also assume that they function of E and of course function of stability like of vertical gradient of mean potential temperature let's say so depending it's stable unstable and stuff like that so um, how we close all this well uh, one of the most uh, common assumptions in this subgrid scale closure is to assume that turbulence uh, subgrid scale turbulence specifically acts as molecular diffusion so basically it's the same kind of generally kind of similar mechanism the small eddies they kind of behave as if they were like molecules 
and they collide they kind of you know they uh, they transport and uh, they transport uh, momentum or uh, or other forms of some scalars around as if it's, it was normal diffusion and using its so called uh, um, assumption which is uh, so we basically assume that our Reynolds stresses um, can be viewed as if it's molecular diffusion so it's uh, equals to minus 2 new this t not just viscosity molecular viscosity but this one is uh, called uh, 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 called uh, eddy diffusivity so it's eddy diffusivity eddy diffusivity or eddy viscosity so for momentum it's probably more appropriate to say eddy viscosity and for scalar fluxes, for scalar fluxes, uh, it would be similar expression. Uh, just uh, uh, instead of strain tensor, we would use like just gradients. So, but for this guy, we just say that this is turbulent strain, S I J, which is defined. So S I J is just as before for molecule that we use for molecular diffusion. S D U I D X G J plus D U J over D X I and it's for me for our grid resolved flow so we know these guys so we know S and then we say that turbulent diffusion by turbulent eddy subgrid scale eddies behaves as if it was molecular diffusion, just very, with very large and different uh, eddy viscosity, not molecular viscosity, but eddy viscosity. But equation is the same. So uh, that's the assumption. Is it good assumption? Well, it depends. Uh, in most cases, it is all we can do. So for uh, uh, many models, probably I don't know, vast majority of all. Uh, cloud models, uh, even climate models, and, uh, uh, and turbulence models, they use this assumption. Although uh, so-called high order closure models that I mentioned before, they don't use this assumption. They actually compute directly this uh, model directly the, this Reynolds stresses. And, uh, but uh, unless you use this uh, high order closure scheme or, or for turbulence uh, transport turbulence transport parameterization for the subgrid scale parameterization uh, vast majority of models use a simpler much simpler approach as I described here okay there is one case though when this one is pretty accurate it's very true uh, including this assumption and uh, and this um, and then you can actually find directly analytical expressions for the relation between turbine kinetic energy and eddy viscosity or eddy diffusivity. Of course, it's not precise, but there are some still assumptions involved. But uh, if those assumptions are true, which are very reasonable assumptions, there is very direct correspondence. You can actually compute these eddy diffusivities or eddy viscosities uh, from uh, turbine kinetic energy and the size of your grid box. That's basically all you need. And for okay, for uh, diffusivity, you also need uh, stability. Um, uh, kind of uh, this guy. Uh, well, I raise it. So basically, how stable your uh, uh, mean profile uh, or resolved profile is. Okay, so how uh, how we do that? So we basically now need to parameterize all these different terms so now uh, for example these two guys these two guys are directly parameterized as just uh, uh, new t well, let's say it's like more like d d x j a new t this eddy viscosity d E plus uh, this pressure 
E and J. So just basically just uh, my, and because nu is a function of x, y, z because it's not constant anymore. It's not molecular diffusion which is constant. It depends on local strength of the uh, of turbulence. So we put it inside this uh, dd like that so that it's going to be divergence of a, of this flux turbulent ad flux. So we now so and, and similar with these guys like. Uh, this uh, rho prime, so buoyancy flux basically, is parameterized as minus d dxj nu. In this kind of, it's uh, let's call this one as t. So this one is t, but for scalars, for so, uh, turbulent AD viscosity, uh, AD diffusivity for scalars, or let's call it BD. And VD is generally is not necessarily equal to VT. Uh, momentum is transported slightly differently, could be transported differently than uh, scalar. Uh, similar thing like, for example, for air diffusivity or this diffusion coefficient for, for air is actually very different, several times different than uh, viscosity coefficient. So uh, there is so-called Prandtl number which actually is a ratio of those two coefficients. So here, uh, Prandtl number may not be one, although for turbulent flow, I believe that it should be very close to one because after all, uh, everything is carried by eddies and eddies carry just the finite size. So they carry both momentum and, uh, and scalars in very similar manner. Um, just uh, physical objects that carry things around like that, uh, this finite kind of, you know, so uh, I don't believe why they should be so much different, um, uh, unlike uh, molecular, uh, process, molecular diffusion and viscosity processes. Uh, for example, when you have, don't have, for molecular diffusion, if you don't have any gradient uh, of, uh, well, never mind. So, um, so this one is going to be modeled like that. So this one is mean, is not horizontal mean. It is grid scale. So this is grid resolved field. So this is uh, uh, important to realize this one. This mean is not horizontal mean. R like uh, when we talk about a boundary layer, for example, uh, usually this mean means uh, like horizontally, horizontal average. Here, our bar means cell, grid cell average. So this is just three-dimensional field of density, and then you just diffuse it like that. So all we need to find now, so we have this model for fluxes, but we don't know uh, added diffusivities. So how we obtain it? So there are um, various methods for that. So the most uh, comprehensive one, and, and basically precise, exactly, exact and uh, both mathematically and physically is basically uh, can be done only for very limited uh, very spe special cases um, and that case is uh, so-called uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence uh, that obeys Kolmogorov's law, so-called turbulence in inertial subrange. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about next. So uh, let's talk about so-called Kolmogorov theory of turbulence. So Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov. Basically, if you um, look at the turbulent kinetic energy spectrum, so it's basically distribution of kinetic energy by size. Um, so here is your E or E of K, and K is a wave number. So, um, so the total kinetic energy equals to just integral from zero to infinity of E of K dK. 
So just the EK is a spectrum. So it could be, it could look something like that. So here you have a uh, uh, large edit. So K is small, it means that wavelength is large. So those are contribution of large edits, large turbulent swirl, swirls. So they can be generated by buoyancy, by say big parcels rising from the surface, heated by the surface. So it can be sheer, like large squall line is going on or clouds generating this uh, turbulence. So, and um, so uh, there is this maximum. So this is large edits. And these eddies are basically generate kinetic energy to begin with generation of kinetic energy. And then there is a small scales where turbulence uh, is getting dissipated by molecular forces. So those eddies are very tiny. So for air, at air, uh, at air densities and, and typical kind of dissipation rates, this scale, when uh, you cannot ignore this molecular forces, so for this edges you can completely ignore them because they're too large for molecular diffusion, but for these scales you cannot ignore them. And so that scale, when uh, molecular viscosity becomes important, uh, is called Kolmogorov scale. And this Kolmogorov scale is for air uh, typical values is about one millimeter or let's say it's one inch like for for uh, just to make sure so on the scale for about one inch large eddies so this tiny molecular forces have become dominating this, i mean molecular viscosity forces become uh, dominating so but there is this kind of range in between of them of those two regimes of large edges and this Kolmogorov scale. And uh, where molecular diffusion is still, I mean, uh, molecular viscosity is still not important, but those edges don't really generate anything. All they do is basically transport edges, uh, transport energy from this uh, generation scales, large scales, to this dissipation scale. So here there is dissipation. And all th this eddies again don't do anything else. They just basically you have this uh, some eddy, and you know turbulence tends to create smaller eddies, and the smaller eddies create even smaller eddies. Like you know that like if you have like puff of smoke, you see that it starts kind of generating smaller and smaller kind of eddies. And uh, so there is this sub range somewhere here where all edges do, they just basically keep dividing, creating smaller and smaller edges, and they transport energy just by inertia. They don't generate new kinetic energy, they don't destroy kinetic energy, all they do just by inertia generate a kind of by available kinetic energy, they generate this uh, uh, edges. So they basically distribute this uh, kinetic energy among many edges here. So this range, of, that's why it's called inertial, inertial sub-range. So it's only transport energy. So in, for this sub-range, all, all it does, it, it, for, for it, uh, basically, because dissipation is approximately equal to production. Production was produced, should be dissipated. So they don't actually do anything else, only uh, transport to the small edges. And the, for that reason, the, this spectrum of eddies in inertial subrange subrange should depend only on what? On dissipation rate, because dissipation equal to production. So that's how much energy is actually produced and, and being transported. And uh, uh, and also, obviously, on K, on the wave number, because just spectrum depends on K. And there is nothing else. There is no really other parameters you can think of.
There could be some stability effect, but we assume that in our initial subrange, stability effects are small. So, uh, uh, although in very stable boundary layer, it means that this initial subrange can be very small because buoyancy forces can be felt. But buoyancy for forces can be felt only over some distance because you need to travel vertically some distance before you start uh, feeling this temperature effect on, on, on your acceleration. So, but typically we, we just assume for this case when we, let's say, have uh, incompressible, incompressible fluid and no buoyancy effect, then this is definitely true. There are no other parameters. And there are dimensions of epsilon which is just destruction of energy, so it's d, e, d, t units. So you, you know this unit, so it should be meters squared per second squared, this is kinetic energy, divided by second, so it's units of epsilon should be like that. And units of k are just inverse length, it's like units are 2 pi divided by wavelength, so it's uh, meters minus 1. So in order for, so there is only one functional dependence um, is E of K should be equal to some coefficient, non-dimensional coefficient um, uh, times epsilon in the power of uh, in the power two thirds K minus five three. This is a famous Kolmogorov's uh, 5 thirds minus 5 thirds power law. Uh, by the way, we see this minus 5 thirds power law everywhere in nature, not only in turbulence. For example, if you plot spectrum of uh, some mountain uh, ridge, mountainous region at height, as your coordinate and you produce spectrum, it's also minus five thirds, even though it's, well, in this, in that case, it's not quite clear why it should be the case, but that's kind of interesting law. So, and we, now we use this law to derive our, uh, uh, our uh, so we need to derive two things. We need to derive, this, uh, we need to know dissipation as a function of uh, E and delta where delta is a grid scale, grid size. Because this is what determines our subgrid scale uh, size of subgrid scale processes. And also we need to obtain new T, turbulent eddy viscosity or eddy diffusivity as a function also of E and delta. Of course, you can use dimensional analysis, but dimensional analysis, by the way, here alpha is approximately from observations is 1.5. So, of course, you can use uh, dimensional analysis, but dimensional analysis does not give you coefficients, this dimensionless coefficients. But you, do, you can actually compute those coefficients if you know alpha. So, the only empirical parameter here in this theory is the value of this alpha, or this Kolmogorov constant. So, how you do that? Well, you have this scale here, somewhere here, which is your grid size scale. And it is 2 pi divided by lambda, so you resolve only waves with 2 pi divided by delta. But actually it's not delta, because you don't resolve delta, or not even resolve, you don't represent delta. Remember that the smallest wavelengths that can be represented on a grid with uh, grid size delta is 2 delta x or 2 delta. So you need to divide by 2 delta. So this is your k max equals to pi divided by delta. So now all this energy integrated from this scale of your grid scale d uh, down to uh, Kolmogorov scale, which is very tiny. So it's basically to infinity for practical purposes. Uh, is your turbine kinetic energy, subgrid scale turbine kinetic energy. So E 
our subject scale of kinetic energy equals to integral from pi divided by delta to infinity of the Kolmogorov spectrum alpha epsilon two third k minus five third integrated over decay. Well, uh, you can very easily integrate it. It's a just uh, Epsilon and alpha are just constants here. You get them outside and then you integrate k to the power of minus 5 third over dk. And in that case, you derive that E equals to <coughs> uh, alpha epsilon 2 third, uh, 2 third, uh, 2 third, I mean 3, 3 over 2, yeah, 2 third. Uh, this uh, pi over delta in the power of minus two thirds. So you see now, if you know dissipation, uh, you know, and you know delta, you know subgrid scale kinetic energy, and vice versa. If you know subgrid scale kinetic energy and delta. And we know subgrid scale kinetic energy, presumably because we use prognostic equation for, for E that we, I wrote before, turbine kinetic energy equation. So if you know E, which itself requires, of course, uh, these guys, epsilon and nu. So we, 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 but we have equation for epsilon, for E. And, and now if we know E, we can substitute uh, to find uh, epsilon or dissipation rate. So from that we have the dissipation rate equal, well I combined some coefficients here, and just some coefficient, let's call it C epsilon, uh, E to the power of 3 over 2 divided by delta. So you see, we have expression uh, for dissipation rate as a function of things that we know from our uh, grid information, which is uh, kinetic energy on the previous time step, let's say, the turbine kinetic energy in the previous time step, and delta, delta which is based on your, our grid size. Now, um, if grid is isotropic or the same in all directions, then it's, you just use delta x there, or delta y or delta z. In reality, of course, there is a question, what to use for delta if your grid is not isotropic? So let's say that delta x is not the same as delta y, is not the same as delta z. And that's a very difficult question. And generally, there are so many models of that, so there is some assumption how you compute that average kind of uh, delta. Uh, one of the most common one in cases when delta x and delta z and delta y are not very different, not too much different, it's not like your delta x is uh, one kilometer and your delta z say 100 meters, so the ratio is one to 10, then you, you would have a problem. And we talk about that a little bit later, how to do it in that case, what to do in that case. But usually in, in um, many turbulence uh, boundary layer say, models, large eddy simulation models, uh, those, those that study turbulence in a lowest level of atmosphere, the grid is pretty isotropic, so your delta x usually very similar to delta y, or even is the same as delta y and delta z. In that, but if they're not very far, you can use uh, uh, some geometric mean, like delta can be uh, defined as delta x times delta y times delta z in the power of one third. So that's kind of very common and typical way. There are some other ways, but uh, there is, uh, unfortunately, theory does not dictate what is the best way of doing that. So this is basically another assumption that we should make. Okay, so now we have dissipation, but we still don't, don't have our coefficient. We, we need that for our turbine kinetic energy equation. And for other equations, like for momentum equation, other, we have this turbulent diffusion there too. So we have terms that we need to model like D, like nu T, uh, 
d dx say square uh, well actually it was, we can actually use like d dx uh, terms like d du d dx so this kind of uh, eddy diffusion of our grid scale momentum or our uh, diffusion say of our grid scale this is turbulent diffusion uh, this is viscosity this is diffusion of say temperature potential temperature grid scale potential temperature and so on. so we need these coefficients in all our equations of our model so how to deal with that so uh, We actually continue using this Kolmogorov theory for that. And here we need to make some assumptions. Well, first of all, we always assume here that our turbulence is statistically homogeneous, which as I said, and it's uh, statistically steady. So there is this kind of steady state, statistical steady state. Uh, do, you, you can only do it uh, for, for that assumption. So it's uh, over, but we assume that those edges are so small that they uh, reach their statistical equilibrium very quickly uh, compared to grid scale, uh, grid scale flow. That's an assumption, another assumption that we should make. Otherwise, we stop. So, uh, how to find it? Well, for that we assume, so we assume that for that uh, the inertial subrange, the production production uh, production uh, uh, of kinetic energy subgrid scale kinetic energy equals to dissipation. So basically, at each moment, at some scale, at all the scales in the in this subgrid in this sub subgrid uh, uh, subgrid uh, for for all scales smaller than your uh, sorry uh, so we we basically say okay uh, yes for for all this edges smaller than this cutoff scale this cutoff scale associated with, with our grid scale production of kinetic energy equal to dissipation. And production of kinetic energy is just uh, this shear term, the shear production term that we talked about. And actually, uh, <clears throat> uh, it can be written if we, like this term, dui dxj dui prime dj. So this one we substitute so this guy for symmetry we can write dxj plus d u j dx i one half and times this one we use our uh, um, viscosity model so it's times two uh, two uh, new so this is minus uh, two new uh, S I J, which in S, this is S I J. So this guy. So from which we have this S I J squared, right? This S I J times this S I J. So and two will cancel. So we have that new S I J squared equals to dissipation. So uh, production of energy equals to dissipation. And this production is uh, uh, everywhere uh, at uh, uh, production uh, for scales which are actually larger than our cutoff scale. I probably said it reverse previously. So it's we assume that all our turbulence is inertial subrange. We don't consider this large edges. We say that everywhere it's inertial subrange except for this small dissipation scale. 
In that case, we can actually integrate. So we basically say that for our turbulence, it all looks like that. So this is E of K, this is K, and only here, uh, so this is our cutoff scale, pi divided by delta, this is cutoff scale. So all this energy is product produced here for this, for our kind of subgrid scale energy. So, and all this energy should be ultimately dissipated in this small scale. So this is basically what it says. So basically, now uh, from a theory of turbulence, uh, for isotropic turbulence, I'm not going to uh, uh, say you how they actually obtain that. It's pretty complicated, actually. But it, it's, it's been shown that this guy equals to integral from zero, from this largest inertial subridge ADIS, to uh, our cutoff scale, or pi over delta, or this E of k times k square times dk. Uh, dk. So this is the integral for, for this Sij. Um, don't ask me how you, uh, how, how, why, why it's so. Um, uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, but this is, uh, it, it, it's a little bit mathematically tedious, but this is what you can actually say. And from that you now can again integrate because you know your EK. Well, we'll write it small here, okay. You know it, it's a Komogorov spectrum. So you substitute it and you integrate it. And from that, you get some expression like, uh, like three alpha divided by four epsilon power of two third pi over delta to the power of four over three. So now you have epsilon here and it equals to epsilon times nu. From which you now have uh, nu t. So now you have this equation. And you have also equation that relates epsilon to E and delta that I wrote before. So epsilon equals to C epsilon uh, E to the power of three over two divided by delta. So if you substitute that and do some algebra, you will arrive to just general expression as nu T equals to some coefficient CK, which is, can be computed from all these pi's, all these alphas and stuff like that. CK uh, delta E to the power of one half. This is very convenient. Now, if we know E at the previous time step, we know delta, we can compute our AD diffusivity or AD viscosity here. And AD diffusivity, that's another matter. It's generally model as some Prandtl number, turbulent Prandtl number times nu uh, t. And how to compute Prandtl number? It's also there is some ad hoc, relatively ad hoc assumptions. I would uh, prefer using just one for Prandtl number, but uh, uh, there are some other models that may, may disagree, but I'm not going to cover that. And they also can be uh, uh, they usually thought as a function of stability. So for, say, very turbulent regime when it's unstable certification, like kind of convective boundary layer, Prandtl indeed is very close to maybe to one, but for uh, a stable case, it could be actually, it could deviate from that. So, and, and that's basically it, we close our system. So now we have enough equations to simulate uh, turbulence, say, in boundary layer. So, uh, um, so this approach is very heavily used, so-called 1.5 order closure, is very heavily used in so-called large AD simulation models. So it's a, so large AD simulation model. What is that? Large AD simulation model, it's a basically analyst or Boussinesque model, analytic or compressible regardless. Uh, 
The main thing about large eddy simulation model is that it resolves so-called large eddies, those that energy producing eddies. So uh, resolves uh, sources sources of kinetic energy. And sinks of kinetic energy is handled by dissipation. That's what sink, sinks it. So it resolves sources, so it should, uh, but at the same time, it, uh, <coughs> and its delta is within, within inertial subrange. So you can use this Kolmogorov theory for to close your system. So this is basically, that's basically it about large eddy simulation. That's why it's called large eddy. You resolve large eddies, those that generate kinetic energy. And uh, you put your delta, your resolution is relatively small, so that it's guaranteed to be within inertial subrange. And the inertial subrange, of course, depends on many things. But typically for boundary layer, like marine boundary layer, for atmospheric boundary layer, in a convective case, uh, good resolution in the order is like 100 meters. So let's say it's uh, from 10 to 100. So delta is from 10 to 100 meters. For a very stable case, it can be actually centimeters or, uh, or less than meter. So uh, that would be pretty uh, pretty difficult case. But typically we use it, uh, if you use this resolution, uh, this approach is called uh, large eddy simulation. So you basically resolve main large eddies that generate kinetic energy. And you basically parameterize all small eddies that all they do is dissipate your kinetic energy using this Kolmogorov theory and this kind of expressions at 1.5 order closure. Uh, however, uh, there is some simplification for this 1.5 order closure. You still uh, have this uh, equation to solve, so you need to carry all this kinetic energy around, and, and it's just one field, it's not probably very expensive, but uh, there is further simplification um, uh, that doesn't involve uh, solving 1.5 order uh, kinetic energy equation. So you basically throw it away, assuming that there is equilibrium between production, exact equilibrium between production of kinetic energy and dissipation. So basically you say that, uh, that your uh, shear production, shear production plus buoyancy productions equals to dissipation, exactly. And you have this shear term there, like I wrote before, it's basically this guy. And uh, buoyancy production, which is just also I wrote this uh, correlation between uh, density perturbations and uh, vertical velocity, and equals to epsilon. And uh, uh, if you do that, uh, you will arrive to the following expression. Basically, you just write and then uh, substitute all these definitions of uh, eddy viscosity and dissipation that we derived from Kolmogorov theory, and you do some algebra. Uh, you will arrive to the following formula that new turbulence just equal to CK divided by CK cubed divided by C epsilon in the power of, of uh, one quarter times delta and all these guys squared. So it's a just so. Um, and times uh, Sij squared, and we know how to compute Sij, right? Minus Prandtl number times uh, beta d theta dz. This is a grid scale. Oh, oh not beta. It's g, g over like that. 
So basically, this one is your local uh, Brent Weissala frequency, right? And this one is uh, shear production. So actually, if you take shear production outside, we can also write it like the following. So let's uh, call this guy C uh, uh, CS. It's so-called Smogorinsky constant. Rinsky constant. So that your new E is written by Smogorinsky constant times delta squared. Shear production. Oh, here it should be one half, sorry. Power, uh, square root. Shear production. So times 1 minus frontal times n buoyancy this is square bread by solid frequency squared divided by sij and this one is like buoyancy over du d d y du dx and so so on so it looks like richardson number local richardson number so these guys together is just Richardson number. So basically, and then from that I actually say that for uh, there is some uh, for some Richardson number, it's actually this term can become negative, and then you have basically no turbulence. So it's like. Uh, this critical uh, Richardson number for stable certification when n, n is actually uh, n, n b squared is positive. So this formula is called Smogorinsky formula and this parameterization is called Smogorinsky parameterization. So this is Smogorinsky formula. And it's uh, why it's called Smogorinsky because this guy Smogorinsky was very famous modeler in our field, uh, he actually uh, dealt with a lot of climate modeling, uh, early climate models back in 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, he's not alive now, of course, uh, but uh, he actually first came up with this kind of formula, completely basically ad hoc, uh, basically using dimensional analysis or something, dimensional arguments. And he came up with similar formula. Um, and now this CS is actually from Kolmogorov theory from this spectrum is equal to 0 0.19. And this is correct constant to use. As a, you, you can find it actually in some models. I looked at it Worf or not in Worf, in, in some other model. It's actually 0 0.25, which I think too too big. It actually would produce too much, uh, too much smoothing of solution at small scales. But probably it's deliberately done. So, but uh, uh, in, uh, generally, you, you can uh, usually people also a little pick this number because you have also implicit dissipation. Remember, by numerical scheme itself that you use, so you need probably some smaller actually Smogorinsky constant in your model because you also have some numerical dissipation that already implicitly going on in your model. So probably you need to reduce it a little bit to obtain correct spectrum. Like I tested in my model in Sam. Uh, this kind of condition when you have only just basically uh, very developed turbulence between two plates uh, and then I looked at the spectrum I found that uh, in my model I can actually get uh, minus 5 thirds lower if I have Smogorinsky constant of 0 0.15 because in my model there is some numerical dissipation associated with certain numerical methods that the model uses but this is kind of normal what we use this is this formula is very widely used. It's called Smogorinsky formula. So sometimes you can hear in lectures, uh, in the presentations, that our model for subgrid scale fluxes used Smogorinsky uh, formula, or well, it's called first order closure because there is no really 0.5. There is no kinetic energy. Here there is no kinetic energy is required. All you need to do is a strain tensor amplitude and, uh, and uh, brent Weissala frequency, so local stability. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so that's basically, um, so 
For this largely simulation models, you can also use this Magarinsky formula. It produces still pretty accurate, uh, accurate results, although it would highly recommend it for large approach use if you are really interested in small scale turbulence in boundary layer uh, to use a, a prognostic uh, turbulent kinetic energy approach. It kind of produces more realistic, uh, slightly more realistic looking results. Also, this formula is very widely used in climate cloud models. Uh, even though in cloud models resolution is uh, uh, thousand meters, and in that case, uh, uh, it's of course not inertial subrange of turbulence, but people still use it anyway by maybe just modifying this Magarinsky constant a little bit, um, because well, there is nothing else. So most uh, uh, large uh, regional models, models of of clouds. They use uh, Smogarinsky uh, model, most of them. Um, there are other high-order high approaches to simulation of turbulence. I'm not going to talk about in this class. They are a really little bit too complicated, like those are based on so-called uh, prescribed uh, distribution of turbulence. Like you can uh, come up with some kind of like some uh, log normal distributions of your perturbations or double Gaussian distributions and so on. And then you can actually close the system because you can directly compute your moments and relate one moment to another moment. And I'm not going to talk about those. They, they kind of, I, I don't know, they, uh, they literate with ad hoc assumptions. Some of them can produce pretty realistic looking results. Some of them don't. And then those who produce realistic results in one cases completely fail in some other cases. So it's very interesting area. Uh, it's probably a good thing to come up with your own scheme as your PhD dissertation, uh, but uh, it's very complicated and uh, uh, it's, it's a subject uh, of active research still. So I like this uh, uh, method based on uh, uh, Kolmogorov spectrum because it's so clear and compl completely mathematically tractable and simple. Uh, you assume that your turbulence is uniform everywhere. That's why you can come up with this one-dimensional spectrum of turbulence that describes the whole thing. Uh, and you can integrate everything and produce this nice looking formulas that are actually easy to code and use in your model. So I, I like this one. So there are these largely simulation models and cloud resolving models also use Mogorinsky formula. And, also, uh, and now I, I, I mentioned one type of models before which is called DNS models. So this one is LES model, latching dissimulation, LES. And there are a second type of models, which is called DNS or direct, direct numerical simulation. And those are just delta. Delta is in the, in the order of millimeters. So obviously these models are usually highly theoretical in our field. Basically they, uh, you cannot use very large domain obviously. So they basically just study how this actually mechanism of converting this kinetic energy to dissipation is happening and maybe find some uh, interesting uh, effects of say, of effect of stratification, thermal stratification in the boundary layer when it's a very stable boundary layer, how turbulent, like shear turbulence, let's say, uh, if you have <clears throat> some obstacles on the surface and very stable boundary layer, and then these obstacles generate all this shear and turbulence, how it interacts and with mean flow, how it dissipates, so that to design to basically uh, maybe come up with some new parameterizations for these specific cases that are very difficult to do. So those DNS models are very expensive. Um, and what they do with this resolution, they just don't use subgrid scale closure at all. What they do, they solve uh, actual uh, molecular diffusion process. So they have terms, actual process like d u d x squared with this new is actual molecular diffusion. So they don't need this closure, subgrid scale closure, because they use very high resolution. But they of, obviously domain cannot be bigger than maybe a couple meters at best. <coughs> Uh, because just computers won't handle bigger domains. So it's very kind of uh, specialized theoretical kind of uh, uh, simulation. So there are DNS models used for theoretical studies of turbulence and then largely simulation models that are very practical. It's used for all sorts of, uh, say, studying stratocumulus clouds, uh, 
behavior stochastic clouds, a turbulence in a, a, a atmospheric boundary layer, or turbulence in an upper mixed layer of ocean, like how, say, wind generates turbulence in the upper layers of ocean. Also, large simulation models very useful for that. And also, uh, Smogorinsky type closures, uh, closure like this, used in the cloud resolving models. So, those models that in the order of uh, grid spacing, in the horizontal grid spacing, in the order of one kilometer, um, they also uh, used there. And sometimes, in, even in climate models, they use similar kind of expressions, which is kind of weird. But if it works, uh, if you cannot do anything else, why not? So, um, um, one, one kind of uh, final comment is uh, what, what do you do if your grid is highly uh, anisotropic? So it means that so your delta x is much, much bigger than delta z. This is subject that's really difficult to approach theoretically. Uh, generally, um, basically what people do and what I do you basically separate two turbulence regimes from one, one another. So you say that there is horizontal turbulence, which is controlled by, by this guy, but in horizontal directions only, and there is no this guy, no buoyancy. So your horizontal turbulence AD is, com is, is computed like this, and then there is vertical turbulence, which is actually involved this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, strain tensor, but only computed in a vertical direction. So there are only DZ terms, for example. And, uh, oh, you can uh, use DDX terms, but they are small anyway, because delta X is very large. So DDZ, and then you include your buoyancy terms, uh, terms and buoyancy kind of correction. So basically, you have two separate set of coefficients for AD diffusivity or AD viscosity. Uh, one set is for horizontal, turbulence, so kind of, kind of this uh, horizontal turbulence, and, and the other set is for vertical turbulence. Why you cannot mix them in one coefficient? Because if you compute this delta using this normal definition of uh, that used in LAS models, then imagine now delta x is like one kilometer and delta z is 100 meters. So it would create in your uh, model very large delta which can be way outside of your inertial subrange assumptions and will produce way too large AD diffusivity coefficients in the vertical, let's say, that would make your model, especially if you use some uh, uh, relatively uh, low stability schemes, would require very tiny time steps and will distort your solution, will make it too diffusive in the vertical. So that's why it's nice to separate those two things and that's what most models do. They just separate horizontal turbulence if you have cloud resolving model, uh, so not large edge simulation, in large edge simulation you just use go ahead on this one, but for, uh, because in large edge simulation model delta x is very similar to delta z, but in cloud resolving models your delta x can be one kilometer and delta z 100 meters, so <coughs> you can't use this formula, so instead you use just two separate treatment for horizontal turbulence and for vertical turbulence.